We have a very exciting session coming up here. Um, I'll start first by saying I promise you it was not this hot in here last year. Believe it or not, I actually wore a sweater the entire time I was freezing. It's supposed to drop about 10 degrees tomorrow, so hopefully it gets a little chillier. Uh, today we'll be talking about uh, the holistic approach uh, for transformational growth, and we have our guests and our moderators, Jeff Shuck and Jennifer Mulholland from Plenty, co-leaders of Plenty, uh, moderating the session, and they're joined today by Stacey Stewart, president of March of Dimes, and David Oman from, uh, I'm going to get this wrong and I promise you I wasn't going to get it right, um, with Global Citizen Year. And uh, David is the Vice President of Development with Global Citizen Year. So thank you very much for joining us. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Jennifer and Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Can you all hear me? Yes, it's on. Welcome. Thank you for being here. And thank you to Classy. We are so excited to be one of their sponsors and partners for this incredible gathering of wonderful idealists like you. We're going to spend the next um, hour or so talking about how we unlock growth from a holistic perspective. My name is Jennifer Mulholland, and I'm joined with Jeff Shuck. We are co-leaders of Plenty, and we're going to be facilitating a juicy conversation in a casual format, um, as well as participating in sharing about these keys. Plenty is based on three core ideas, and the first idea we say hope needs help. The world needs changing and change isn't going to happen on its own. The second idea is in our name, which is the idea that we're not competing with each other, we're competing with the thought that there isn't enough to go around. And our third core principle is really what we're going to talk about today. It's that tactics aren't enough. That to create the kind of large scale, long term change that we're all working to create, that it's not just about a better email system or software or the right people or a better marketing brand. All of those things are important, but to get the kind of transformative growth that we're all striving for, those, those pieces need to be fit together and aligned in the right way. And that is what we're going to explore today with our panel. So to get started, we have asked David and Stacy to give you a little bit of a preview and a background of who they are and the perspective that they bring to you today. So um, St Stacy, would you like to start us off? Great. Well. Um, Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for inviting uh, me to be here, and it's, it's great to be in this setting. Um, and, and I can already feel how warm it's going to feel with all these lights in just a little bit. Um, my name is Stacey Stewart. I'm the president of the March of Dimes, and um, I've been in this role since uh, November. Before that, I was the U.S. president for United Way uh, and actually started my career in, on Wall Street and then worked for 17 years at Fannie Mae and, um, and at the Fannie Mae Foundation. And I, so I've straddled a few sectors, a couple of sectors, and, uh, and, and had a, a lot of different roles. Uh, there is a theme that makes sense, while it doesn't really make sense about how someone starting at Wall Street ends up at the March of Times, there actually is a theme there, which is um, I went to school and, and uh, got an MBA in finance and was really interested in, uh, in, in business and strategy and, um, and management, but wanted to do it in the context of social good. And um, when I was even on Wall Street, I didn't work in corporate finance or mergers and acquisitions. I worked in an area called public finance, which was doing the same thing, but to finance roads and bridges and schools and housing. Working at Fannie Mae was a big Fortune 100 company working uh, just to uh, provide housing for, especially for low and moderate income families. Uh, moving to United Way was in the nonprofit sector, but when I was at Fannie Mae, I, I moved from the company to run the Fannie Mae Foundation, which was at the time the largest affordable housing foundation in the country. Um, that then led me to United Way, one of the largest nonprofits in the, in the world, and I was the U.S. president, which was the largest part of the net network, and now at March of Dimes. So it's always been in these leadership roles, management roles, but, but working uh, in organizations that are about doing good for people. Um, and so coming to March of Dimes in November was, um, was really an interesting step for me. Uh, a lot of people know the March of Dimes, and they know the name, but they have no idea what we do. Uh, and therein lies our, our challenge, but also our opportunity. Uh, the March of Dimes is uh, just about 80 years old. We'll celebrate our 80th anniversary next January. 
uh, a very historic organization that um, has done something that very few organizations um, can say that they've done, which is set out to uh, address a major health challenge and actually solve it. So the March of Dimes was started uh, under the leadership of President Roosevelt um, back in the late 1930s to address the polio crisis at the time, which was you know, a huge epidemic and, um, and a frightening one for many, many uh, Americans and many folks around the world. Obviously, President Roosevelt was suffered from polio and was committed to finding a cure. And after mobilizing the philanthropic giving of literally millions of people around the country and, um, and focusing on investing in the best medical research that money could, could, could find and buy, um, after many years of focusing on finding a vaccine for polio, it was actually discovered by Dr. Jonas Salk. And that was how the March of Dimes got started, both as an organization focused on science and medical research, but also on mobilizing the good of people to want to be a part of something bigger than themselves and, and a part of a cause that was really important at the time. Um, and so we've continued that work now, 80 years later, working on other issues that impact children and, um, and obviously one of the biggest ones is around preterm birth, which is the leading killer for children between the ages of zero and five. Uh, it's, an, it's an issue that a lot of people don't, are not as aware of, but it's one that is a huge issue, especially if you uh, have been impacted by it in your own family or in your own life, you know um, what a devastating issue it can be. So to lead this organization at a time when we're trying to undergo tremendous transformation, uh, at every level. Um, so from our brand and really positioning us so people understand who we are and why we matter, uh, all the way down to operational efficiency and how we actually operate more effectively and efficiently as an organization, that's what I've been focused on. Um, and doing it with uh, not a lot of time uh, uh, to, uh, to waste is really a, a major challenge. So we can get into that, but it's really a pleasure to be here. and. I'm, Happy to share some things, also to learn from some of you all about what, what you're facing as well. Thank you so Thank much you. for being here. David, would you like to share? Excellent. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is David Oman. I'm a Seattle native and University of Michigan alum. Oh. Uh, Go blue. Never hurts to say it. Um, and I have, I've really devoted my career to the field of education uh, and asking how do we shape the values and priorities of the next generation of leaders in our country. And so I started my career as an elementary school science teacher in Houston, um, which may sound fairly straightforward, but it actually meant that I saw all 660 students in my school, collaborated with all 35 other teachers as their homeroom cycled through my science lab. Uh, so I saw, I basically was trying to stay a week ahead of my kids uh, on the material that I was teaching pre-K through fifth grade, um, but was I mean, the most rewarding professional experience of my life uh, and has given me a passion um, to really focus on thinking about our, our next generation. I spent about a decade at Teach for America working on the recruitment side, helping to scale its recruitment efforts, uh, going from a relatively small footprint on the West Coast in particular um, to continuing to invest in building the diversity of the core. So investing in uh, HSI and H uh, HBCU institutions, uh, thinking about how we tap into big public state universities, uh, and just get more of our top college graduates thinking about a career in education. Uh, after overseeing most of Teach for America's on-campus recruitment efforts, uh, decided I wanted to shift to a much younger organization uh, and hopefully apply a lot of what I had learned during a massive growth swing at TFA. Uh, and so two and a half years ago, I joined Global Citizen Year as its first Vice President of Development. Global Citizen Year is a relatively young organization, not quite the maturity or the history of, of the March of Dimes. Uh, we've been around for about eight years now, and we are on a mission to reimagine the way that students progress from high school to college uh, and in creating a new generation of global leaders. So our core fellowship, uh, we recruit, train, uh, and support a fantastic group of diverse high school graduates to spend an academic year abroad in the developing world before they start college. So reimagining the gap year, uh, which is probably the worst name you could give it. it, sounds like a chasm that you fall into and never get out of, uh, as a much more integral bridge and launch into uh, adulthood. Um, and thinking about what are the social and emotional skills, what are the global skills and competencies that young people need to thrive in our ever more connected world. 
Uh, and so at Global Citizen Year, 80% of our fellows receive need-based financial aid. We're the only organization in this space that has a clear commitment to access and opportunity for low-income students. About half of our kids identify as, or excuse me, are eligible for Pell Grants once they get to college. 95% uh, of our alumni uh, are thriving uh, as, as either current college students or have graduated college. Um, and we've grown tenfold since our inception in 2010, starting with a pilot of just 10 kids. We're now at about 130 a year, uh, and we have an alumni community of about 500. So I'm eager to uh, share a little bit more about the work that we are doing uh, and what I have learned. Uh, I think the, the plenty name is, is very fitting. I think that you know, one thing I've learned in the development space is that there is always more to go around uh, if you operate with an abundance mentality. So excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. I want to introduce Jennifer and myself, and then she'll tell us a little bit about Plenty. But first, I just want to acknowledge there's a fifth panelist who's here in spirit and not actually here unless Sweat has moved her off the stage, and that's Betsy Gerdeman, who is the Vice President of Development Services for PBS. She had a scheduling conflict, and we talked to her this morning. She's literally heartbroken that she could not be here. And we'll invoke her ideas throughout the session. If you can imagine being in charge of funding for PBS right now in this political climate. It is quite um, an undertaking, and she is truly fighting the good fight. So we'll uh, share some of her viewpoints as we go. In terms of Jennifer and myself, we've known each other for over 20 years. We met when we were in grade school, curiously, <laughs> um, or maybe slightly after. And we recognized immediately that we share, we share the spirit of idealism. We use that term unapologetically, unabashedly, we are idealists. We look at the world and say, if it could be better, it should be better. If it isn't better, why isn't it? And that is the spirit that has really driven us in our careers. We first worked together about 20 years ago in a technology company that was one of the first companies to web enable higher education systems to bring access to people who were looking to get uh, higher education and couldn't, couldn't get online to get it. And at that point, each of us had already worked in the nonprofit sector, had started businesses, had been social entrepreneurs. Through that work, Jennifer stayed on to become a technology executive, becoming chief innovation officer for a Fortune 500 company, and really um, growing enterprise at scale before realizing that her calling was well-being and spirituality and founding a set of consultancies that helped executives figure out their authentic, their authentic way of being. I um, left that firm and went to work at a firm called Pilata Teamworks running all of their large scale events before starting a company called Event360 that is still in operation and produces large scale fundraising programs. About three years ago, we rejoined and reconnected and decided to merge our efforts into Plenty. So Plenty, at Plenty, our whole mission is to help organizations and idealists like you increase your social impact and unlock growth. Our vision is in our name. So as David mentioned, we believe in a world in which there's plenty for everyone. We truly believe there's more than enough to go around. And we reject this idea that we are competing with each other. We see that we're really competing with a mindset of scarcity, a mindset of lack within ourselves, within our communities, and within the world that is perpetuating an old paradigm a paradigm of competition. And you see here at the collaborative, it's all about working together. It's all about harnessing the community. It's all about activating the collective. And that is truly our mission here. We have a retreat center in Park City, Utah, and we bring leaders and organizations to come and do individual work. We help organizations align their strategy, their teams, cultural creation, funding models. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But we believe that organizations are made up of people. And in order to heal organizations and activate and unlock the growth and really create social good, we have to support the whole people that are operating in those organizations. And that's really the basis of our conversation today. We're going to talk to you about the five keys to unlock transformational growth. It's a holistic perspective. There's not one tactic. There's not one answer that we are looking for as individual people and that we're looking for in our organizations to get to where we want to go. 
So we're going to orient you to the five keys to really unlock that potential, that abundance, that hope, that idealism that we're all seeking. So we just want to start, we're going to take um, about three or four minutes just to walk through this model and then as a panel we'll um, discuss it and we're going to leave, we have a clock right there and we're going to leave time so you all can join the discussion as well. The idea of this is it's a model, right? So it's, it's not you know, exactly accurate. The idea is this, this is not every component to growth. The idea is that it's accurate enough that it helps us as people and organizations plan and grow. And the evolution of this was really a lot of the evolution of plenty. Most of our work, especially three years ago, started with a funding doorway, a funding question. So we work with large and small organizations and they come to us and say, we need more revenue. And our viewpoint on funding, very similar to what Saul said this morning, if, um, if you were in that morning session, you know, revenue can be a really hungry beast. And often we were noticing that we were creating great revenue solutions, great fundraising campaigns, great marketing campaigns, and the problems at the organization never seemed to be solved, right? Revenue has a way of, of wanting more revenue. And this kind of lends itself to our first viewpoint, which we'll explore in a second, that funding is actually not the goal. And when we see funding set up, you know, I need 10% more growth, the immediate question is, well, why do you need it? Do you need it because your CFO said that you need it? Do you need it because there's a hole in the budget? And uh, amazingly, many of our clients, at least initially, can't answer that question. So our viewpoint on funding is that, you know, money is energy, right? Money is never the thing that keeps us from doing something. Money is a vehicle through which we do something else. And it's leveraging that reciprocity, that giving and receiving cycle that we're going to explore today that helps to unlock abundance. The, you can look at these keys as doorways, and they're all interrelated. We look at funding, when we see funding issues, we often see that there's misalignment, and that leads us to strategy. Strategy is about alignment. It's not about making plans. It's not as much about the what as it is the why and creating coherency, creating a conversation, activating the process with the people in the room, with our teams, with the executives to understand what, where are we going? And that answer needs to be flexible. It needs to be agile because in this changing world and climate right now, speed is, change is constant. It is faster than ever. Our planet is rotating at an incredible speed right now, and everything is evolving at a quickening pace. So we need to be agile and flexible with our strategy. Really, the idea here is that that time that we spend creating a, you know, a 10-sheet project plan in Excel and a 500-line budget you know, the budget's going to be out of date as soon as you put it on the piece of paper, right? As soon as you hit January 1, something's going to collide with your plan. Th that's not the value of the plan. The value of the plan is a discussion around why we're doing it in the first place. So strategy, we got to strategy by realizing that fundraising problems couldn't be solved with funding answers alone. We needed some strategy. In the same way, that's how we got into leadership. Often when we see that there's a strategy gap, it's not because there aren't great ideas, it's because the leaders aren't communicating well enough to, to triage the ideas, to brainstorm better ideas, to resolve their conflict about which ideas should take prominence. And our viewpoint on leadership, so, so le leadership is a strategy issue, strategy is a, is a funding issue. Leadership nowadays, as, as you can see just by looking in the newspaper, really more and more is about authenticity, not authority. You can have the, the most authoritative job in the government of the United States and not be able to mobilize people because they don't trust you or believe you. Leadership in the world where everyone has access to information and everyone can be a megaphone is about being real, is about knowing what you want, is about being willing to share that with other people, about being willing to be vulnerable. Yeah, leadership is about finding your unique blueprint and expressing that courageously, confidently, vulnerably. And when we look at leaders, when we, t when we talk about, when we talk to executives, it usually is literally 30 seconds a minute before they close the door 
and they talk about how stressed out they are. And those are well-being issues. They're human issues. We all have them. We can't escape them. We have so much on our plate. We're multitasking more than we've ever, ever been asked to do before in all the roles we play, right? We believe that well-being is summarized in this idea that you no longer have a personal life and a professional life. You have one life. You live one life because you are the common denominator. Us as human beings, we bring our full selves to work and at home. And the idea that they're separate is an old paradigm. It's an old culture. It doesn't work anymore. I'm sure you all can relate. You have a stressed out day, right, at work. Do you bring that home? Of course. Of course, you need to find a way to decompress. And similarly, you have a fight with your spouse or your children. You come to work. Are you fully present? Do you have a clear, open mind to receive the insights that need to come through for your professional tasks at hand? No. So we look at well-being as how do we support ourselves as leaders and our companies that we lead and the team members and our clients that we serve from a whole perspective. How do we help them become healthy, happy, and whole? So this was the insight for us that increasingly as we were solving funding issues, we weren't creating organizational change. And that there's a link between funding all the way into better strategy, better leadership, and ultimately people who don't feel seen, heard, or fulfilled. And you know, we have countless stories of this and it still surprises us. A really quick one that I think accelerated this model was a couple years ago helping a, about a $40 million a year group get out of a decline and create 15% growth in one year. After talking to that CEO at the end of the year, we said, how do you feel? Don't you feel great? I mean, it's $6 million more. And he said, no, I'm more stressed out than ever because now my board wants 20%, right? Okay, well, that's the issue we need to solve. And ultimately, we thought we had all the keys. You know, a year ago, we would have said there's four keys to growth. And then we realized we're missing something that's this. This is the spirit of the collaborative, that if funding issues are solved with better strategy, and strategy is actually about being authentic, and authenticity is about being safe and whole, the only way we can really find that is in each other. And that's the fifth key, community. And our viewpoint on community, whether you take a left brain view of it or a right brain or a head and heart, is that the answers are in all of us. That often the wisdom that you're seeking, your constituents already know. The better donor campaign you want, ask your donors. The product idea, listen to your customers. Right? The healing that needs to take place in the organization, talk to your staff. Community is the fifth key. We only get better well-being through each other. And that leads us all the way back to funding. And as Jen said, the idea is there's not really a sequence. Some organizations are better at one key than others. And if you join us for the session after this, we'll actually go through an assessment so you can rate yourself and your organization on each of these. But the idea is that together, if we can solve these things in, in, in concert, we actually have a better chance of aligning ourselves for growth that lasts and makes a difference. Yeah. And that's how we activate the wisdom in the community, is connecting peer to peer. And that's our intention on the panel. How can we extract the wisdom, the insights, the juiciness, the nuggets for us all to learn and share? And that's the spirit of the collaborative. So we're going to explore a few of these doorways and keys in a conversation to better understand David, your and Stacy's experience with them, your viewpoints, so we can all learn. And then we'd love to give you all some time to share and ask questions as well. So let's kind of go in the funding doorway, this idea that funding is not a means to an end, right? Or it is a means to an end, rather. It's not the end state, right? It's the process of getting there. Can you talk a little bit, David, about your perspective on funding and growing revenue and what you think about this idea that it's a means to an end and not sure. the end? Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's fitting because this morning in the car that I took over here, the driver said, oh, you do fundraising, that must be really tough. And I feel like that is a, a reaction that probably any of you who work in fundraising, either part of your job or your full job, get from time to time. 
And it always makes me pause because I don't quite understand why people assume that this must be so tough. My, my best guess is that people are operating from this uh, perspective that there is a power differential that is impossible to overcome, where you as the fundraiser are the supplicant. And probably the best thing that I did when I started at Global Citizen Year, this was my first development role, was to read a book called The Generosity Network. Has anybody read The Generosity Network? See a few hands. So the notion here is, is really what Plenty is all about, that there is an abundance, that if you are operating from the perspective of you on behalf of your organization have one asset, and that asset is a way to achieve impact. Your donor, the relationship that you're building, they have another asset in terms of their money. Oftentimes we don't think about how challenging it is for a donor, for a funder, to create real impact, to find organizations that they care deeply about, that they believe are creating change in the world. <clears throat> and what I've found is that by building a relationship, by asking questions and understanding what motivates a funder, whether that's you know, listed on their website or it just happens to be their personal lived experience, you better understand how you can, you can both win in a situation where you are able to offer one asset, a path to impact, and they are able to offer another, their funding. And one way that we have approached this at Global Citizen Year um, is to think about, and this gets a little bit into the community, um, but to think about our peer organizations who are also doing this really well. And we have asked ourselves, who can we learn from and how can we share information with others? And so we have started over the last year uh, to do what we are uh, very inelegantly calling donor swap calls, uh, where we are getting on the phone with a peer organization and saying, hey, here's a link to some of our great partners and supporters. Share yours with us. Let's take a look and let's talk about you know, the people in our world who would be really motivated by each other's work. And probably a lot of people who listen to that say, oh, you know, hands off my donor list. Like, these are mine. And that is a scarcity mentality. But when you think about it as, okay, how do I connect a donor who is so meaningful to us where we have seen how they have created impact in our organization, you know, I, I would want that donor to be able to create impact elsewhere. Uh, and what we found is that through these donor swap calls, we've created really what I think of as a win-win-win, where we have been introduced to new potential partners, our peer organizations have been introduced to new potential partners, that we have, we have made those introductions, and the donor, you know, him or herself, is able to create impact that they were not previously aware of. Um, and we have just found that to be so enriching. Uh, and it's something that, I mean, to that, that you know, executive who uh, hit their target but always has more, you have to look for the things that give you the innate joy and pleasure in this work. And creating, creating impact, connecting with someone in that way is, is tremendous. One other quick thing I'll share, and then Stacy, I'll let you chime in, um, is just our approach to events. Um, I think you know, the word gala, oftentimes elicits a big groan um, from people who work in organizations, from people who attend them. Um, and we have generally steered clear of galas. Uh, we have found that not to be partially just because we're a small organization, but partially we just don't see that as being a, an authentic representation of who we are and what we do. So instead we've prioritized a couple of smaller uh, targeted events. So one is something called the Jeffersonian Dinner. Um, and a Jeffersonian dinner is where you invite a small group of people, about 10 or 12, literally to dinner. You sit around one table and you have one conversation the entire evening with that entire group. And generally you start with a question that is not about, you know, what do you think about Global Citizen Year? But instead, you know, we had one in New York a couple of months ago and we said, what life experience most shaped your identity as a global citizen? And that elicited a lot of really interesting reflections on the part of the people around the table. Individuals made connections among themselves um, that were, I think, surprising to them. Uh, we walked away with that with new relationships with a much better sense of what motivated some of these people around the table. Uh, and just logistically, we had one of our board members host this and they invited a group of people who were not known to us previously. But interestingly, you know, we've heard that a number of the people who attended that dinner have stayed in touch and have come up with new ways to collaborate that are wholly independent from Global Citizen Year. 
The other uh, event that we have experimented with is what we call a sort of sponsor a fellow event. So I mentioned our alumni community is 500 large now. 80% of our alumni are in college right now. About 20% have now graduated. Um, and what we found is that the best way to make our impact real is to just get our alumni front and center. The, the less that I am talking, uh, maybe this is an exception, but generally <laughs> the less that I am talking, the better. The more that we can put the face of our program in front of people, uh, you know, the more that they are going to understand what we do, the more they are going to be receiving um, the, the benefit of this program. Uh, and we are now in, right at the end of year two of a three-year strategic plan. So year one for us was all about securing new commitments. Year two this year has really been about how do we show the love to our partners and supporters? How do we make sure that they understand the impact that they are having and that they want to continue to deepen their engagement with Global Citizen Year over time? I love that. Um, to, to restate the obvious, I, you're, you're at talking about community and funding and so much more. Before um, we go to Stacy, I think that idea that you just used as an example, to ask a unifying question that everybody can relate to, helps to create connection. It, it's the human to human. We call that peer to peer. And what ultimately you're talking about is connecting passion to passion. So we increase revenue by activating the community, by aligning people to what they care about. We use a question about what brings you joy. Passion's at the center of every model and every experience that we do because it is what unifies and then ultimately you know, ends in movements and ends in funding and ends in revenue growth. Mm -hmm. But Stacey, I would love to hear your yeah. perspective. You have such rich and diverse experience in your leadership yeah. roles. Your perspective on funding. Well, I, um, it was interesting to hear this perspective and I think I need to provide some context for kind of where we are relative to how we think about revenue and funding. So, you know, I gave you a little bit of a history of the March of Dimes, almost 80 years old, uh, and really pioneered one of the most successful um, walk programs in the whole country. I mean, I walked in a March of Dimes walk when I was about 12 years old and in Atlanta, Georgia, where I grew up and just walked in the same March of Dimes walk <laughs> a couple months ago. Uh, a little bit different. It wasn't 20 miles like it was when I was growing up. It was only, you know, a 5K, which was very helpful to me now that I'm a little bit older. But, um, but we um, we have relied very, very heavily um, for a number of decades on events-driven revenue for to really fund the organization between. Um, almost 500 walks that happen uh, all around the country, uh, engaging about a million people who walk with us every year, uh, to special, other kinds of special events that happen at other times during the year. So a vast, a, a substantial majority of our funding comes from these very episodic but repeat, repetitive events that happen every single year. Um, that really have uh, perpetuated um, a climate, I would say, at March of Dimes where we have very transactional relationships with people. So here we are engaging literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people every year. We recruit them in to come spend a few hours with us, and then we have allowed them to leave. And then we try to go through the whole cycle again every single year. And what, we, um, what we're very focused on right now, especially over the past few months since I've been there working with a great team of folks, um, is really how do we stop that attitude that the people that come to participate with us, that spend their time, that give their money, uh, that allow themselves to connect with us, how do we change the behavior in terms of our our uh, engagement with them to one that's less transactional and really one that is more relational. In other words, how do we begin to really get to know those individuals for who they are, why they connect, why they really want to be a part of the March of Dimes cause, the, not just our organization, but the, the cause and the impact that we're trying to affect in the world. How do we maintain those relationships over the long haul? even for someone that is giving $25, $50, $1,000, all the way up to people that are giving $10,000, $50,000, $100,000 or more. And that's really, that is not just a change in business process, that really is a change in culture. And in some cases it's a change in talent because people that know how to do that really come with a different perspective, different skill set. 
And doing that in the digital age is really both, is really a great opportunity. So in other words, we actually, through digital tools, can get to know people better at scale than we ever could before. It's very difficult to do that in an analog world or in a sort of face-to-face -face world. How do you get, get to know a million people really well? But in the digital world, you know, you can do that. You can get to know people well. You can find out more about what they care about, the issues that really motivate them to stay involved with us. And so the idea now for us is if we have a million people that come to us, how do we keep, keep them with us? How do we understand them better? And how do we make sure that they see us as a cause that they want to stay connected to over the long haul? Now some of them, some of our most passionate donors are people who've been impacted by our issues. Um, they're not only our most passionate donors, they're our most passionate fundraisers, and they're our most passionate ambassadors. And so really the issue for us is how do we connect them with that passion, not just connecting with their dollars, but how do we make sure that we're tapping into that passion that exists, and we're actually figuring out ways to do better, a better job of storytelling. So how do we um, ensure that if I have passion around that issue because I've been personally impacted, how do we make sure that someone that maybe hasn't been personally impacted with the issue can feel that passion and feel attracted to it in ways that allow them to enter into our, our world as well and our sphere of, of activity and then become more deeply involved? I think the other thing I would just say is that it's been really important for us to not look at people as ATM machines where we go and stick the card in and the money spits out and then we move on and you know, when we need more money, we just come back to them. I mean, that obviously is not a model that works um, for many organizations, certainly not for us. And so if we look at people as real people who have passion, they may give to us at some point, but maybe that's not what the first thing we hit them with. Maybe we find out more about them, what they care about. Maybe it's, through, maybe it's advocacy around policy change. We have a huge effort going on in Washington right now and in state capitals around the country to advocate for maternal and child health to make sure that you know, maternity coverage is not seen as uh, a pre-existing condition and is not excluded from health coverage, which is really an issue that we have to deal with today. If that's where people's passion is, you know what, that's where our passion is too. And so if that's the way in which we engage people and if that's where they want to stay in the advocacy and they never give, give us a dime, that's good. You know, what we want are supporters and people who are connected to our issue, not necessarily you know, wanting to be connected to them just because of the dollars they have to give. But if they come in through one channel and it eventually results in them not only just advocating for us but maybe volunteering for us and then eventually giving to us, that's great. The more and more ways in which we can have people connected into the work we do and feeling good about their philanthropic involvement across the board, that's ultimately what, what we're facing and what we're shooting for. So we're not trying to measure success just in terms of dollars raised but really in terms of the number of activated and engaged supporters who really are with us for the long haul. I love, I love all of these points, and I am just going to ask the people at the Collaborative to extend our session one more hour, because <laughs> um, clearly we're going to need 30 minutes on each of these topics. There's two points I want to make, and then we'll, we'll move on to strategy and how you're keeping your organization aligned. One is I want everyone to listen in to how both David and Stacy integrated community right away. Right? So when we go into an organization, we can almost measure how well the, how robust the funding streams are by listening to how often the staff complain about donors and funders. The more complaints, the less you are aligned to growth, right? We actually have groups say to us, our biggest problem is our donors are unreasonable. They want us to do something that we don't want to do. What? <laughs> can you imagine Nike saying that? Can you imagine Apple saying that? Now, the donor doesn't always know how to construct it, but when you're hearing your donors ask you for something, you have to listen. It's, it's gotten very, very trendy nowadays in this space to say there should be consolidation in the nonprofits, right? There's, there's too many nonprofits. You know, it's kind of an interesting thought model, I guess. The more interesting question for us is, wait, why are there a million organizations? When there's already thousands and thousands of organizations in any issue area, why does someone feel like they need to start something new? It's because they don't see themselves in what you're doing. They're not the problem, right? 
you're not listening to them in the right way. So that's one point. We could spend another hour on that. The other point I want to make really, really briefly is the importance of looking with, unfiltered, with an unfiltered lens, seeing reality in your funding. Often programs look a lot more diversified than they are, and the gala is what triggered this. You know, most galas, some galas work, some galas don't. Authenticity is a great arbiter, whether it's right for you or not. But often a $5 million gala is actually a $1 million recognition and major giving program, right? You can literally unpack the revenue and see, wow, 20% of it comes from this one person. We liquored them up, we talked to them for a year, we made everyone in the room see that they were buying a lot. There's nothing wrong with that necessarily, if that's authentic to you, but don't fool yourself that you're raising $5 million equally from 5,000 people if you're on. In a very similar way, a lot of walk programs that are making transitional money are actually community and stewardship programs. They're creating a huge fabric of awareness that's hard to quantify. So seeing the funding source for what it is rather than tricking yourself into thinking it's not is really key, which I think I'm gonna to use to take us into strategy. And the idea of strategy here again is that the planning process is important as the plans, right? The idea about creating alignment, do we know where we're going and why, is just as important as can we get there. And Stacy, you know, again, you can probably talk for a half hour on this. You have a, there's a massive ship in motion and you're correcting course at the same time and you've teed up some of this. Some of it means new talent. How are you keeping your team aligned and your stakeholders and your donors aligned while you're turning course? Well, I want to pick up on a word that you said I think was most important, and that is why. So one of the things that has happened in the March of Dimes is that, you know, you could look at the issue of why, uh, why we matter, why we're relevant, why people should care about us. You can look at the what we do and the how we do it. And if you're, if for us, as we proceed down really developing a whole new strategic direction and vision for the organization, we're looking at all those questions. But for us, it was really important to start with the issue of why. Because when you look at our history, you can almost argue um, that what the March of Dimes got started as is an organization that was focused on a what? Solving polio. And then it was focused on how through medical research. The question for us, though, once we got those things done was, OK, so why do we matter again? Why did we do this in the first place? And why are we doing what we're doing now? And that was a different question that we needed to ask people. And when we were started asking people, pe people had different answers to the why. Um, and so we said, you know, it's really important if we're going to really transform this organization and put us on a very healthy course strategically, we need to get to a shared understanding of the answer to the question, why we exist and why we matter and why, we sh why people should care and why do we care. And so we actually asked um, some folks from EY and who worked with a guy named Simon Sinek, who a lot of folks have heard of. If you've never heard of him, go to YouTube. He's an amazing guy. And he, we, he really, they, that team really helped launch us on something that we call purpose-led transformation, and which is really that we'll transform if we are clear collectively in a shared way about the answer to that question why we exist and why we matter. And so we actually have really solicited input from board members, from external stakeholders, from staff. We've gone through a whole process over the past several months to actually engage people in this understanding of why we exist and to write our why story of why the March of Dimes matters and why people should care. And that has been the tip of the iceberg now to then really create or um, it's the tip of the iceberg or really a foundational <laughs> point, it, it, uh, depending on how you look at it, for how we now will build a strategic vision over the next three years, um, how we'll then set some real um, milestones in terms of success. But it also has done something really important, which is create this other issue around alignment. Because what we feel is that if everyone feels inside the passion and the connection to why we matter, things can flow from that, right? It's not it, that we're forcing people into a particular you know, uh, direction. Um, if people understand the why, then the logic flows as so then the choices we make strategically and then what we choose to do and how we choose to go about doing those things. And so in other words, it's, it's sort of pulling our staff and our volunteers to a place that is, is drawing from their passion internally 
to then really execute on something that we feel will really give fuel to our future. And that alignment is going to happen naturally. Now, I will say to you that we're going through a major shift. And so one of the first steps I did was to help lead us through this was to hire someone who would be our VP of Strategy and Transformation. She actually is here um, today because for, us, for the president or CEO of an organization, I find, I find it's really important to lead major league change. Um, you've got to have somebody who's on point to help you through the steps that it takes, right? It's not, it's a major priority of mine, but having someone who wakes up every day helping me think about it and think about next steps and stay one step ahead has been really critical. And, um, and actually, I came to that uh, by listening to other leaders and talking to other folks about how they led large-scale transformation, which is really important. So we're in the middle of our story right now. Um, you know, I hope that in two or three years we come back and can talk about this major transformation. But I can tell you that people are very excited. Last thing I'll just mention is that change happens in terms of tone and tenor and direction and all of that, and that's really important. And the board and executive leadership have got to be very much aligned. But I'm going to tell you the most important step in this for me, um, and our VP has really led this, is finding everyday staff members who are willing to be a part of that change. So we have initiated something called an early adopter program, where we just ask people to hand raise and say, do you want to be a part of leading this change? Now, you could be at the most junior level of the organization. You could have just been in the organization a few months or maybe a year, but it, it doesn't mean that you can't help lead the change at wherever you are. And so what we actually kind of asked people to do was to step up and be leaders, wherever they are, at whatever level, and to be those, and to help lead not just a top level change, but really a grassroots change that we think will enable not only strategic direction to be executed on, but also culture change as well, so. I love that. I think, you know, you demonstrate an ability to listen and to harness what people care about. And I think that is this idea that relates to community, it relates to funding, it relates to creating alignment. The process is the product. The conversation, giving a shit, is the process, right? Like really asking and caring, being present to what your team at all levels, they sell, they, I love that, they self-raise, right? They tap, we call that tapping themselves on the head. We empower people by giving them the ability to choose what they care about what they're passionate about. And then connecting passion to passion is what unlocks growth. It's simple. It sounds complicated when we talk about the five keys, but it's super simple in what you're explaining that relates to creating alignment and it relates to activating growth. Because of the time, we're gonna just tee up well-being and give you all a couple of minutes to, to ask any questions that come to mind. But shifting to this idea of how do we take care of ourselves? Like, how do we really actualize this idea that we have one life? Because us as leaders in all different levels, it's, uh, it's stressful. There's a lot of decisions to be made. How, David, do you kind of find that balance of your whole self, um, or do you, is a good question, <laughs> and then we'll, we'll tee it up to the audience. Sure, sure. So, I mean, I, I think it's a, a constant challenge, of course. Um, and rather than, uh, rather than give you all the personal details of how I think about it, I think it's probably instructive and helpful to, to zoom out and think about this at an organizational level. Um, at Global Citizen Year, well-being is our number one core value. Uh, and that is because we expect it of our fellows. We talk a lot about what we call the stretch zone. So this is the area where you know, we believe that most learning happens. It's not where you're comfortable, it's not where you're panicked, it's somewhere in between where you're exposed to new experiences, you're learning, you're being pushed beyond what you're used to. But it's very easy for the stretch zone to get into the panic zone if you don't have a strong sense of well-being. And so at Global Citizen Year, we model this uh, and, and we build it from the inside out uh, in, in our organizational policies that all of our staff uh, have access to. Um, and so that's everything from a, a flexible time off policy where we don't track the number of vacation days that our, our people take. If you've got you know, a couple of weeks here, a couple of weeks there, that's fine. It tends to, tends to work out. People take three to four weeks a year, uh, which is about what we would you know, ask them to do if we had a, a more mandated policy. Um, after two years, uh, we, on, on staff, um, we pay for our employees to go visit one of our country sites and work on a project. 
Right now, our fellows spend the year in either Ecuador, Brazil, Senegal, or India. And there are lots of needs that we have in our country site, but it is incredibly gratifying to our staff in the US to be able to see day in and day out what is happening with our fellows, to work with them at an apprenticeship site, um, to participate in the training sessions that our team leaders lead in the field. Um, after three years, we offer a one-month paid sabbatical to do whatever you want, um, to, to lean into the personal side of your passion. Um, in general, uh, every year, uh, we offer a professional development fund. Every single staff member can allocate 100 bucks to learning whatever they want. Uh, and $500 to choosing a, uh, a job-aligned professional development opportunity like coming to a conference like this. Um, and so we, we build this into our staff, but then we each model it. Uh, our founder and CEO um, just came back last week from a five-day silent meditation, which is something that I frankly could not imagine doing. Uh, it is not my personal well-being, but it is hers. And she models that for the rest of the staff. Uh, a lot of people go to noon yoga. Um, from our office. We are lucky in downtown Oakland, there's a yoga studio right in our ground floor, which makes it easy. But the key is that if you model well-being as an organization, your employees will model well-being for themselves. And that is a very simple and obvious idea, but I think that there are far too many organizations that don't think about how to build well-being into the day-to-day. -day. I just want to before we go to questions, I briefly want to make a point about this. We made a conscious choice to put well-being right in the center of this diagram. And frankly, there are a lot of groups, social entrepreneurs, socially minded businesses and nonprofits that see that and pass over us and choose someone else. And that's just fine. Um, but I'm getting sick and tired of talking about well-being as a soft issue. Well-being is not a soft issue. This is the clear and present danger for this sector. Absolutely, 100%, I have come to believe that. If your model requires your staff to take a 30% pay cut to work in a toxic environment for the privilege of doing good, you don't have a sustainable model, period. And, 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 all, the, and all the amazing talent is realizing that and they're going to for-profit companies that pay them better and allow them to make a difference. So we got to get our heads out of our rear and take care of people and allow that to be a conversation that takes place in the workplace, not something that people do two days a week to recuperate from the slog that they went through during the week. Um, so that's my soapbox on that one. <laughs> With that, um, we do still have time. We have almost 10 minutes. We'd love to hear from you about these three topics or any of the topics that we teed up or anything else that you'd like to hear from Stacy or David or even us. We're going to wipe the sweat off of our faces as someone brings a microphone to you. So we have a question up front. We have a few, actually, and someone's coming to you right, here. right now. Let's start right in the middle there. Uh, David, I was just wondering, you talked about like private donors and stuff. I'm not sure how long you've been with Global Citizen here, but how did you guys early on as a startup, since you guys haven't been around very long, connect with those donors, find those donors, and really kind of out of random find those people who want to help you guys fund those operation expenses, but also help the students? Yeah. It's a great question. Um, so our founder and CEO launched Global Citizen Year out of business school. And she won a pitch for change competition at Harvard Business School, which got her some of the seed funding um, that she needed. But then it was a matter of, I mean, really going out and pounding the pavement. Um, she was invited to a couple of conferences early on. She gave a talk at the Aspen Institute. And so she was provided the opportunity to share her vision of Global Citizen Year. But then it was really a matter of asking the question. You know, when she was invited, she was invited to join a sort of an entrepreneur program early on. Um, and she asked, you know, who else would be passionate about this idea? And that is a question that we ask in every single meeting. Um, and, and one of the things that is hard for us is that we do not fit in hardly any box. So 80% of our philanthropic dollars are from individuals who personally resonate. 
Uh, very few foundations fund us because you know, we're not K through 12, we're not higher ed, we're somewhere in between. We're not domestic, we're not global, we're somewhere in between. And so for us, it's always this question of you know, who are the people who have had the lived experience? Or in some cases, the foundation president who sees how this connects multiple things that their foundation cares about. Um, but it, I mean, it's, frankly, it's a challenge. And this is also where the, the donor swap calls that I mentioned earlier have been incredibly helpful. Um, people I, I have found are much more willing to share their knowledge, to share their relationships when you explain why and when you just ask. I, I think so often people shy away from asking because you, know, you, you, you fear offending or you fear crossing a line there. Um, but what we found is that, that those sorts of opportunities you know, are, are ones that, that turn into a win-win-win. Um, similarly, the, the events that I mentioned, where we have a single donor or a single board member who then shares about Global Citizen Year with their own network, that brings people to the table who we never knew. Uh, and sometimes those turn into funding conversations, sometimes they don't. Like Stacy said, sometimes that, that is someone who can be a great advocate, or they are on the board of a university, and they say, you know what, my university should send 10 incoming students per year through your program. Um, so at Tufts here in Boston, we actually helped create what they call the one plus four program, uh, where all of their admitted students get their acceptance letter and it says, congratulations, do you want to come this fall or next fall? And if you want to come next fall, consider taking a global citizen year. And if you can't afford it, we'll pay for it. Um, which is tremendous. So we found that you know, awesome. introducing ourselves to people, getting our board members to introduce us to people, even with no expectation that they're going to do something, helps us just network around. And it takes time. Um, but we find that that's how you build the, the real relationships that will drive your work forward in one way or another. I love the comment about um, we don't live in a box. You know, we, we're living in a world where the lines of the boxes are dissolving, right? and being our authentic selves or exploring where the donors can come in, where those relationships are, come in are all interdimensional because we're dealing with human beings. So I love that point as well. Let's take another question from the audience. We had a couple other people raise their hand. Hi, my name is Jordan. I'm the founder and executive director of an organization called Miss Amazing. And I'm curious how specifically you take information about your donors and turn it into hard data that can then turn into strategy. Oh, I love this question. Um, do any, either of you want to take a crack at that? Well, um, we're, uh, we're in that shift right now where um, I think we've relied on old systems where um, you know, old CRM systems that just kind of stored data about people and then you can never extract it out or you have to pay to extract it out. And, and then it's not, it's not analyzed anyway. There are no insights to a world where we're actually getting bits and pieces of information about people um, with real insights about what does this really mean for us. So we were actually just looking at some things. Our, our vice president for marketing is actually here today. and. We were actually looking at some insights um, that really we were able to pull through some tools from social media um, about a portion of our donor base um, and looking at all the issues around um, their beliefs, their choices, their lifestyle, not just pure demographics, but really getting some other information about the kinds of things that they engage in in their lives outside of their involvement with the March of Dimes is actually helping us to understand some things um, around our brand positioning. Um, so we're taking a lot of that hard data and now embedding in it into the work we're doing around brand strategy and brand repositioning. Um, we actually are taking some of that data and looking at what it means for us in terms of how we, um, how we are more uh, seen as an organization, not just around supporting medical research and a, and a medical issue, but also advocating for these issues around, as I mentioned earlier, maternal and child health. So one of the things that we're trying to really understand is if these are, so there's one thing I would say about this is that it's one thing to look at our current set of donors and understand where we are now, but we also know that we're in the midst of trying to transition to attracting new audiences in. And so some of the information that we're also trying to, um, trying to identify is of the new audiences that we want to attract in, what are they thinking about? What are they involved in? What are their needs? What are their things that really motivate them in their lives? 
in ways that would help us understand how what we would have to do on our end to present ourselves as a cause that would actually be meaningful to them. So in some ways, when you're meant to transition, it's not just for us. It's like it's good to know it, what exists today, but what's really informative is if we have a sense of where we need to go, um, what does that world look like, and how do we open ourselves up to the kind of data and insights that might be available to help us craft new strategies to attract them as well. So. Oh my gosh, Sarah, I want an hour to talk about this topic next year at the Collaborative, but here's my quick answer, super quick. It's easier than ever to get data on your donors. They're giving it to you and you can buy it and it's a little creepy and it's very inexpensive. But often, almost every case, we do a lot of analytics of plenty and in almost every case, the most important question we don't know the answer to, which is why did you donate? That is the key question. People are more willing than ever to talk to you, particularly those people who are engaged with you. They want to tell you. We just deployed for a client last week a survey in one day. We got a thousand people to answer this one question. Describe yourself to us in one word. Fascinating. The way you can, the way we can mine text data now makes mining that super, super, super easy. We learned more about our donors by asking them directly this one question that was nowhere on anybody's radar screen than we did in a year of buying and doing data matches through well screening and Axiom. So often just asking people why they donate and what they're like can be relevatory. So we have run out of time and we would love to invite you back. We're having a breakout session that's more interactive following, immediately following um, this session right here, where you'll be able to do a little self-assessment around the five keys for your organization. But as you leave today, we'd, we'd hope that you can garnish um, some insights that were sh shared by David and Stacy around this interoperability of unlocking growth, that it is holistic, that we are interdimensional, that organizations are made up of people, and that we have to activate the community by connecting passion to passion to unlock growth. Thank you so much for being here, and we look forward to seeing you at the conference. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Stick around. Thank you.